guilt and pride Blood of Christ the crucified From your hands, your feet, your side Jesus, I trust in you She was telling me that both of her son-in-laws had contracted some demons and were very hard to live with. And, um, and uh, I happen to, I know at least one of her daughters. No, I know both of her daughters. And um, they were very hard to live with. And I thought, you know, this is really strange nowadays how many people are manifesting great troubles. I was reminded about what the Lord told to Demetrius do that he was going to do between here and the end was that he was going to bring people that had problems um, and things that they wouldn't repent of through certain chastenings, um, sicknesses, uh, demonic oppressions, uh, so on and so forth, uh, to bring them to repentance. And um, I'm certainly seeing and doing that because there's an awful lot of that going on now. I don't think I've ever seen more of this going on right now. But also, the whole country is, uh, seems to be going crazy. I was thinking about uh, Revelation 18 where it talks about Babylon, the judgment upon Babylon. And uh, verse 2, it says, And he cried with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And has become a habitation of demons and a hold of every unclean spirit, or actually a prison of every unclean spirit, and a hold of every unclean and hateful bird. Okay, I was in my house in the middle of, of a valley surrounded by mountains. I remember seeing some object hitting water. We liked. This is a dream. Uh, so Jim yeah, was in mine. We like south of, or we live south of Salt Lake, so it was in the same direction the lake is, is from us. I knew that the water would be coming our way in a few moments. Later, the water started to flood everything and the house went underwater. I was with my daughter and we swam to, on top of the water. I remember looking off in the distance and saw a few red dots, the only color I remember in the dream, which I assumed were people on the sides of the mountains around the valley escaping the flood. There were many people living in the valley, but only a few on the side of the mountain. I started to swim toward the people, and I felt something grab my legs, and it started to pull me under. This happened several times, and I remember gasping for air and barely getting away. I eventually was freed and made it out of the water to where the people were. People were trying to figure out what happened, and I had shortwave radius and things like that, but they were lost in the flood. I thought, I thought I might be able to look for these things once the water was gone. The flood quickly subsided, and everything was dry out like a desert. There, that is where the dream ended. This is the second time in the last year I have had a dream of an object striking the earth. The Lord has been showing me that the only way to get out or to get through the get through what lies ahead is by abiding in Christ. Amen. And the question was, how do you recognize the mind activity and stuff like that? Well, um, Michael's uh, dream is very, very spiritual because um, the people that abided on the mountains were in no danger of the flood. And, um, you know, Jesus said, spoke, speaking about the judgment that was coming upon Jerusalem, he told his disciples to, that when they saw these things happen, to, to flee to the mountains, you know. And that's uh, very symbolical because. The high places of the earth are recognized as places of safety, you know. And uh, Michael was 
swimming towards the mountains even after the flood had hit. And, uh, and uh, he saw where the people were in safety and he was swimming towards the mountains. And obviously, you know, we need to be living on the mountains in these days, you know, because I think that's a spiritual revelation there. Um, and God really wants us in the high places of the earth. He wants us above the world, you know. Um, no doubt there will be physical meteors hitting the earth and causing tidal waves and those kinds of things, you know. But um, if we're abiding in Christ, like Michael said, we've got nothing to worry about. Um, the secret place of the Most High is, is abiding in Jesus. And uh, that's where our safety is. That's where all of, our, all of our provision is. That's where our salvation is. It's all in Christ. So thank you for that, Michael. And uh, appreciate it very much. And I think Michael had that dream the same time that Bob McCarty had his dream about the, the three um, meteors or whatever they were that came to the earth. So what was the question? Again? Oh, how do we tell demonic activity in song? Activity. Well, usually it's very unreasonable. <laughs> you know, very abnormal. It, it, and it doesn't seem like um, you can um, you can reason with this person, nor does it seem like they can even repent in some cases. Because uh, they're given in to some lust, uh, some force, some power that's stronger than they are. And um, I'm saying that in the natural, but in the, in the uh, spiritual, God has given us a gift called discerning the spirits. So that we can recognize uh, demon spirits in people. And also something that's very useful is uh, uh, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, because God can just speak to you what the demon is in the person. I've had that happen to me. The Lord just speak what it is. So that's another way that God can do it. You can get a word of knowledge. You can get a discernment of the spirits. You can tell quite naturally in most cases if you're familiar with with um, with what the Bible has to say. The people of the world don't recognize this. They recognize it in many cases uh, just um, schizophrenia or uh, mental uh, problems of, of sorts. That's all they all, they see as the natural. You know, but the truth is. There is no such thing that uh, is not, you know, the demons manipulate the physical realm. The doctors can look and see physical reasons why people have mental problems. But the demons manipulate the physical realm, just like they do with sickness. Of course, there's going to be a physical reason why a person has this mental problem. But the truth is, that's demons. And um, many Infirmities are also demons, spirits of infirmity. And as Christians, we can begin to recognize these things and, uh, and deal with them the way the Lord taught us to deal with them, and that's just take authority over them. But I want to say that, that uh, Babylon has been ordained of God to be demon-possessed. <laughs> you see it in the Bible, Revelation 18. Uh, God's people have a right to deliverance. Uh, unless they're walking in the flesh and walking out from under the blood. Uh, obviously, the devil has been given authority to take advantage of God's people who walk out from under the blood, walk in unforgiveness or bitterness or, or lust. Um, the Bible is very plain that God turns people over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, for chastening, so that they will repent. Like 1 Corinthians 5 and 5, the man that had his father's wife, uh, the Lord turned that man over to Satan through Paul, turned the man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit would be saved in the day of the Lord. The Lord does that. We have, we have a guaranteed right of deliverance. The world does not. Um, God's going to use this world for our good. And I can tell you that, that Babylon uh, represents the United States in a secular form. It also represents uh, false religion in another form. But uh, Babylon has been given over to Satan. I believe you're going to see people in this country more and more possessed 
leading up to the time of the man-child's ministry, is a great witness and a testimony to God's power to deliver, but also uh, because God has ordained that Babylon bring God's people into bondage. And so God is going to turn this nation over to a reprobate mind of sorts. And it's going to be ruled by demons. You know, in the Bible, it only says twice, um, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, that uh, the devil is the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14 and Tyre in Ezekiel 28. That's the only two uh, nations that uh, were said to be having the king being the devil. That's the only two. And both of them represent the United States in the scriptures. Both of them do. And we already talked about that a while back, about how Tyre was uh, was an, an island in the sea that uh, was a, a world, had a world navy, had a um, was like Babylon in that it was a center of commerce, um, all these things. And uh, also had a mother that was north and east of her, who was the, the, the uh, head of the Phoenician Empire. But Tyre inherited that leadership of the Phoenician Empire. Same relationship with America and Britain. Britain was the head of the, uh, of the uh, uh, British Empire. And um, the lions and the lion cubs, and yet America is, is has superseded Britain in that cause, and and it is an island uh, south and west of uh, Sidon, which is we are also an island south and west of Britain. So there are a lot of we compared a lot of we looked at a lot of comparisons here recently. How the Tyre in the Bible was to be visited by God. After 70 years, and it says the exact same thing about Babylon. After 70 years, God was going to visit her. And I told you what the Lord told me was that that 70 years represented seven years of tribulation. Because God, God ordained that Babylon conquer the people of God. You know, the reason, uh, a lot of Christians don't know this, they've worried very much recently about America being destroyed from an attack by the Russians and the Chinese. And of course, there have been many prophecies, many dreams and visions, and they are true, too. It will happen. The only thing is, in the Bible, the reason that God destroyed Babylon was because they conquered and destroyed the people of God. For instance, look at uh, Jeremiah 51. I'm, I'm, I'm looking in this direction because I want to explain to you what's going to happen to America and why we're not going to be able to trust her. Uh, Jeremiah 51 and verse, I'll just share with you a few verses here. Uh, let's say 34. Jeremiah 51, 34. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. That, this is uh, Israel speaking. He hath crushed me. He hath made me an empty vessel. He hath like a monster swallowed me up. He hath filled his maw with my delicacies. And he hath cast me out. That's the people of God speaking of the treatment that they received at the hand of Babylon. And verse 35. Uh, the violence done to me and to my flesh be upon Babylon, shall the inhabitants of Zion say, and my blood be upon the inhabitants of the Chaldea, shall Jerusalem say. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will plead thy cause, and take vengeance for thee, and will dry up her seed, and make her fountain dry. And Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for jackals, an astonishment and a hissing without inhabitants, and so on and so forth. And why was that? It was because of the reason of the way that they had treated the people of God. They conquered, persecuted, and killed the people of God. And, uh, you know, 44 is another example. 44 says, And I will execute judgments upon Bel in Babylon. Bel was the, the dragon, the god of Babylon. He's the Baal of Babylon, right? 
and uh, I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he has swallowed up. The nation shall not flow any more unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. My people, go ye out of the midst of her, and save yourselves, every man, from the fierce anger of the Lord. Well, Revelation tells us the same thing. Come out of her, my people. So, so God basically is going to judge Babylon because of what they're going to do to the people of God. And I know that's really hard for people to believe, but yet, that's what God tells us in the Scriptures. And he says in Revelation 18, in verse 2 it says, And he cried with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, and has become the habitation of demons, and the hold of every uh, unclean spirit, and the hold, or prison actually, prison of every unclean and hateful bird. And by the wine of the wrath of her fornication, all the nations are fallen. The kings of the earth committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth waxed rich by the power of her wantonness. And I heard another voice come uh, from heaven saying, Come forth, my people, out of her, that you have no fellowship with her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Well, uh, the thing about the hole or the prison is that um, the Babylon is going to be full of demon-possessed people. And as you know, Babylon is both secular and religious because religion in itself, too, is no protection from the devil. Uh, I shared with you about a local revival here that I prayed for a sister, and she uh, had a vision in the midst of the revival, and she saw that over the revival was a dragon. Well, that's who Bell is. Bell was the dragon. And you know, in Revelation 12, who the dragon is, it's Satan. Who is the king of Babylon? Satan. Isaiah 14 tells you very plainly. He's also the king of Tyre. Satan. Why does Satan want to rule Babylon? Spiritual and physical Babylon. Uh, why does Satan want to rule America? Because America rules the world. And Satan is the god of this world and he wants to be the head of this world. So he, if he rules America, he rules the world. And he wants to rule America, too, because he knows that America's job is going to be to persecute the people of God and bring them into bondage. The uh, last piece of Revelation, the dragon. That's right. The dragon is going to rule the world, right? right. And then, you know, the tail of the dragon casts down. A third of the stars of heaven. There it is again. Dragon is going to cast down a third of the stars of heaven, and that's the stars of heaven are Abraham's seed, right? So there's a great falling away going to happen because of the dragon. Uh, how does you know that again? There is a there's also a spiritual battle, which is apostate religion. So America has come together as a a secular Babylon. A secular harlot. And uh, God's going to use the secular harlot to persecute the people of God. Uh, look at Hosea chapter 8 and uh, verse 1. Here's what God says he's going to use to bring his people to repentance. Hosea chapter 8 verse 1. It's right before Joel, right after Daniel. And he says, set the trumpet to thy mouth. As an eagle, he cometh against the house of the Lord. Because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed my law. Well, the eagle, of course, in that day was Babylon. You know, Ezekiel 17 tells us that. That's what God called her. The great eagle. And the great eagle today, of course, is America. And the whole purpose for America going the way she's going, falling, you know, falling from from uh, what we have known her, you know, the way we have known her. We're not we're gonna see her that way no more because America is going to continue to fall. You know, fall 
doesn't mean that you've been nuked and knocked out and all that. If you go to to uh, Re- uh, Romans, uh, it talks about the, the fallen brother being the, the brother who has fallen in his doctrine, falling in his thinking, falling in his ways, you know. Yeah, fallen from position. We're not talking about destruction there. Uh, when he said fallen, fallen is Babylon, she hadn't been destroyed yet. She was coming to destruction because of that fallen state. Babylon's going to fall. Like the Bible says clearly that Babylon did of old. Babylon, which was the head of gold, that ruled over the image of the beast, was the head of the image of the beast. That Babylon fell. And the king of Babylon, in a very clear type, lost his mind for seven years and uh, devoured the grass of the field. And so we're not going to recognize... The, the thinking, the mind, the government of this nation, nor the people of this nation much longer. Uh, it's going to go through a very, very bad stage. And that stage is going to be for the purpose of purifying his people who are in apostasy. See, God is using this whole world to bring his people to repentance. And that's why he says that I'm going to come as an eagle because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed my law. They shall cry unto me, My God, we Israel know thee. Israel hath cast off that which is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They have set up kings, but not by me. And they have made princes, but I knew it not. And their silver and their gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. So, you know, the leadership of Israel, they set up people that God didn't know. And uh, God's people don't recognize the fact that they put people in positions that, that God didn't put there. And yet that's what he's saying right here in 8 and 4. That God didn't put there. You no, know, I just saw on the national news this evening, uh, they showed the coronation of Reverend Moon on the national news tonight, and there were senators and congressmen and all kinds of um, high and important people there, and they crowned him the Messiah on the national news. Can you imagine? Today? Today. They showed it on the national news, how they crowned him as the Messiah. Boy, isn't this something? The guy has... From the very beginning, I mean, this is not a this is not a shock to anybody. He's claimed to be Christ from the very beginning of his ministry, as far as I know, many many years back. Uh, the Moonies, they all believe that he is the Messiah, so he's claimed that for a long time. But now, uh, our own people in the highest parts of our government were were there. Why were they there? Because the man is a billionaire, and he's very free with his money. And he'll throw it around, and people, in order to please him, will go to that extent. Now, of course, the news people ask some of these senators and people like that, well, what are you doing here? Well, we didn't really know they were going to do this, you know. (laughs) Well, they they ducked, you know. They ran for cover. Yeah, they ran for cover. Three or four or five of them. And the guy's got a lot of money. And I I don't know, some of you you probably received the article I sent out uh, about how the Reverend Moon has been especially doing his best to buy out uh, the evangelical leadership of Christianity in America. Done everything he could. Anytime any one of the leaders of evangelical Christianity gets in trouble, he's right there with the money to bail them out. And they're they're big buddies. A lot of them. I sent you the article. I, I don't know. There's probably 15 of them there, 15 or 20 of them there that they mentioned in the article. All the big ones were there. Yeah. Uh, leaders of Christianity that are buddy buddy with him because he bailed him out and he's uh, uh, very free with his money, like I said. And uh, uh, he's made uh, front organizations, you know, uh, uh, like uh, Christians for Freedom or something like that organization. He, he makes these organizations and these people, these leadership leaders, leaders of Christianity are are uh, the heads of these organizations that he's making, and so he's got a way to funnel money to them. They're all supported totally by him. This is just astounding. If you didn't get the article, send me your email, and I'll send it to you. Uh, 
But this is amazing. You know, these guys don't understand that this man is anti-Christ. Closest as you'll ever get to any man who is anti-Christ, this is him. He claims to be Christ. And yet they're being bought out by this guy. Well, you know, when I sent that article out, it offended some people. Because in the article, he was talking about these same people being uh, worshipers of President Bush and calling him a Christian and uh, just praising him in every way they can. He can do no wrong, you know. And uh, some people are very offended by that. There's a lot. Most of these particular people and the ones that follow them believe in that craziness that President Bush is a Christian and he's doing everything a Christian leader should do and so on and so forth, which is totally off the wall. And, um, you know, why, how can the leadership of Christianity be so foolish as to give in to bribery to a man like that? How can, um, how can this country turn against Christianity except that Christianity has turned against itself and Christianity has turned against God and um, been ignorant of his principles? And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just totally awesome to me. You know, if you follow this chapter, um, for instance, go down to, in chapter 8, down to verse, uh, well, verse 5, he goes on to say, You have cast off thy calf, O Samaria. You know, Samaria set their, up their calf, and they called it Jehovah. And uh, Samaria was uh, the northern tribes of Israel. And Samaria also represented the people that that came in, that the, the Chaldeans came, put, uh, Syrians, excuse me, um, settled the land, the northern ten tribes, with these people who were not Jews. And so um, when God started judging these people for settling the land of the Jews, and they weren't Jews, um, the the prophets told them that it was because they didn't know the God of the land. So they brought in priests to teach them about the God of the land. And so Judaism came to be known by these people who were not Jews. So basically they were keeping the religion of the Jews, but they were not Jews. You understand that that's happening today? <laughs> there are people that are putting on a show of keeping the religion of Christianity, but they're not Christians. And that's what Sumerians represent. Understand? So, and the golden calf, of course, was their idea of, of God. And I shared with you my revelation of, the, of the, the, the calf in these days, that it was religion. God took me. I, sh- I shared with this man who objected, who, by the way, is a pre-tribulation rapture, doesn't have very much discernment, but he objected to the, the article that I sent out. And uh, he said, and I told him, I said, listen, God told me he was going to move the Saul's out of the way and make room for the David's. And God showed me the apostasy and the leadership of the church. And he said, yeah, but you're probably talking about the old line denominations. I said, no, sir, I'm not. I'm talking about the whole leadership of the church, like it was in Jesus' day. The whole leadership is apostate, like it was in Jesus' day. And then I shared with him how that God took me and showed me the uh, the cat the cow the the calf now come to full age the cow and then showed me the leadership and it was the top leadership of Christianity in America even the spirit filled leadership of Christianity in America <laughs> they told me that they were the bulls of Bashan because they were sowing their own seed in that calf and I told this man I said no you're wrong. So he, he told me he knew one of those men there, uh, Bill Bright, who was a very close friend of his, and he just knew that there wasn't anything wrong with him. I says, well, can you tell me anything in this, it's in this article, this organization that he is the head of, that was totally funded by Moon, can you tell me that that's not so? Well, no, I can't tell you that's not so, but I know the man, okay. Well, you know, first of all, there's no discernment in people that, this particular man I shared with him the truth, the word of God, about what's going to happen to the church in the tribulation. He couldn't see it. Had no discernment whatsoever. You can't trust the discernment of the people that are under these people. They don't understand. They don't see through them at all. You know? 
Uh, follow this chapter on down a little bit further. Verse uh, 11. It said, Because Ephraim, Ephraim in another period of time was also called the northern ten tribes, okay? And Ephraim also was, of course, the second son of Joseph, who inherited the first son's double blessing. And Ephraim represents the church in the scripture. Because Ephraim hath multiplied altars for sinning, altars have been unto him for sinning. Uh, I wrote for him the ten thousand things of my law, but they are counted as strange as a strange thing. Isn't it interesting, you know, how little the people of God are, are impressed by the word of God. They're more impressed with their traditions than they are the word of God. He says, as for the sacrifice of my offerings, they sacrifice flesh. And eat it. Of course, we're, we're to partake of the manna, right? But they're partaking of the flesh. But the, but the Lord accepteth them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. You know what? We're coming to a time when God is going to remember their iniquities. You know, he forgot our iniquity, didn't he? According to the blood, according to the sacrifice, uh, he cast it in the depths of the sea to remember it no more. And yet, he can dredge it back up, can <laughs> he? said he will remember their iniquity. They broke the covenant, right? Our covenant is that God won't remember our sins as long as we abide in him and we walk under the blood. He will remember our sins no more. But when we break the covenant, it's broken. And God can do what he wants even to the fact of remembering our sins. So he's going to remember their sins. Like he remembered the Jews' sins at the time of Jesus, he remembered their sins. And it was because of Jesus himself uh, and the word and the truth and the power that he remembered their sins. Now these days, he's not talking about Israel, he's talking about the church. Verse 14, For Israel hath forgotten his maker and hath gilded uh, palaces or... Um, Temples, well, of course, they're good. On, they're great about that, building the big temples, you know, to impress people and uh, to have plenty of comfort. And Judah hath multiplied fortified cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and I will, and it shall devour the castles thereof, or the palaces thereof. Rejoice not, O Israel, uh, for joy like the peoples. For thou hast played the harlot, departing from thy God, and thou hast loved the hire upon every grain floor. <laughs> the threshing floor and the winepress shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail her. Uh, go down to verse 7. Now we're getting back to the to the hold of every demon, the cage or the jail of, of every demon. Verse 7. The days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The man that hath the spirit is mad. For the abundance of thy iniquity and because of the enmity is great. Now, this is the verse the Lord gave me. When I was thinking about all these ministers, both spirit-filled and non-spirit-filled, who have taken to uh, liking and taken to the bribery of uh, Reverend Moon, and uh, this is the verse that came to me, I thought, wow, isn't that something? It even says, the man that hath the spirit, because there were some spirit-filled leaders in that group, too. Most of those people had rejected the Holy Spirit. Most of them had rejected the power of the Holy Spirit. The works of the days that we're in, they rejected all those things. And they're the most guilty. Okay? But the spirit-filled people who should know better, um, some of them are doing the same thing, except for the same bribery. What are they going to do, friends, when the mark of the beast comes along? There's, that's a strong bribery. Because they're, gonna, they're going to, first of all, threaten to kill you if you don't take that mark. And if you don't take that mark, you won't be able to buy or sell. That's strong bribery there. And this is just 
mere money that they're giving into now. You know, they don't think they're going to be faced with that. They don't think they're going to be faced with that, but they are. Every last one of them is. That's how God's going to separate them from his kingdom. You know, you sent me a thing, uh, Bernice, about uh, Benny Hinn, the Knights Templar. You know, how that he was buying into that organization, which is totally ludicrous for a spirit-filled person to do. You know, doesn't he understand who they are? You know, what is it, what is happening to these people, this leadership? What is God turning them over to a reprobate mind? When God told me years ago he was moving the souls out of the way, uh, immediately they started to be a great falling away. Many ministers were being caught in their adultery and in their fornications and in their idolatry. And uh, immediately very big names were being caught after that. In fact, the very day he spoke that to me, that night, is when the Jimmy Swagger fiasco came on the news. First time I ever had ever heard about it. But when it happened, I knew exactly what the Lord was doing. You know how God moves people out of the way? He didn't say that they would be dead. He just told me he was going to move the souls out of the way and make room for the David. You know, he's not talking about physical death there. He's talking about fallen in, in sin, fallen in doctrine, fallen in their connection with God, you know. Like these prophets here. He says, the prophet is a fool. The man that hath the spirit is mad for the abundance of thine iniquity and because of the enmity is great. See, God is going to let them fall. Verse 8, Ephraim was a watchman with my God. As for the prophet, a fowler's snare is in all of his ways, an enmity in the house of his God. A fowler's snare. Who's the fowler he's talking about here? The fowler is the prophet. The fowler is the spiritual leader. Why? Because the fowler uses a snare. To catch people, to put them in the cage, right? The power here is the religious leaders who are capturing God's people, God's ignorant people, and putting them in this cage of bondage in Babylon. Like we read in um, Revelation 18 and 2. They're going into bondage. And the religious leaders are doing this. I'll give you a good example. Look at Jeremiah 5. And uh, 20, we'll back up a little bit. Let's see, Jeremiah 5 and um, 24. <laughs> Pray that God help you escape not only them, but their doctrines. God will do it. God will bring the truth to, to his people. Verse 24, neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, to give us rain both the former and the latter in its season, that preserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden from you good. Hey, look what he's saying here. They give it the rain, both the former and the latter rain. Remember in Jesus' day, they rejected the former rain. The ministers of God's people rejected the former rain. And in these days, you know yourself that they are rejecting the latter, the latter rain. They're going to reject the latter rain. Because the ministers, the overwhelming majority of ministers in these days reject the former rain. They don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. They don't believe in the healing power of God. They have a form of godliness and they deny the power thereof. The Bible says, from such turn away. In other words, these people who are rejecting the reign of the Holy Spirit. You know, God gave this reign of the Holy Spirit to, to the leaders of Israel in the Old Testament. They were called God's anointed. When they received the Holy Spirit, it was to Lead Israel. Now in the New Testament, they, they consider that they are able to lead God's people without this anointing. And it's not possible. That's what we talked about in our last meeting, how that you can't follow your mind. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And yet these men 
are following their minds. They can't hear the voice of the Spirit. They've never been filled with the Spirit. They rejected the Spirit. And so they rejected good. And wh- who are they? Verse 26. For among my people are found wicked men. They watch as fowlers lie in wait. They set a trap and they catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and waxed rich. And of course their houses, they want to have these rich houses and they want to be seen as rich and powerful and in the world. But he says that these people are fowlers. The snare of the fowler is talking about the leader, the false leadership of Christianity. How that they set, lay snares for God's people. And these are the people that have rejected notice. The former and the latter rain. You understand the outpouring of God's spirit to lead his people, to deliver his people, to empower his people. Going to reject the former and the latter rain. And their idea is to trap people in their cage. You know, the snare... You, you have to snare the bird before you can put it in the cage, right? And they, that's their job, is to snare the bird. You know, how, how can we keep from being snared? Young Christians out there, you know, how do you keep from being snared by some religion that you're impressed with? See, if you don't have knowledge of the Word, and you don't have the Word written in your heart, it's easy for you to be impressed with something that may be worldly and not godly. And so you have to really, really study the Word of God. And you have to know who your leaders are. The Bible says in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. Well, who's our counselors? Who's our number one counselors? Holy Spirit. That's right. But it does say counselors. So it could also mean, which is the same thing, Bob, you know, because the Holy Spirit did speak to us through many counselors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, so on and so forth. Those counselors who wrote the New Testament, that's our main counselors. We can't depart from them. In the abundance of counselors, there is safety. The patriarchs. The patriarchs, that's right. And, you know, if you go, for instance, to uh, 2 Timothy, we'll come back here, but look at 2 Timothy for a minute. 2 Timothy 3. You know, if you're in a church and they rejected the, the former reign with what those... Um, Disciples had, get out of her. That's what the Bible commands you to do. Get out of her. Because that's not a church. They're liars. That's a prison. That's another cage. That's a religion. Those are, those are, those are fowlers that do their best to entrap you in something that's uh, not even a close facsimile to Christianity. You read the book of Acts. First, uh, second Timothy three and one says, but know this, that in the, the last days. Well, that's obviously where we are, right? The last days. Grievous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, haughty, railers. That, folks, he's not talking about the world with people here. He's talking about the Christians. You read on down, you'll see that. Disobedient to parents, and unthankful, and unholy, and without natural affection, implacable. Uh, Slanderers without self-control, fierce, no lovers of good, traitors, headstrong, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, but having denied the power thereof, from these also turn away. For of these are they that creep into houses and take captive, there it is, captive, silly women, laden with sin, led away by divers' lusts. In other words, he's not talking about physical women here because all through the Bible they used women as a as a sex of God's people, groups of God's people. And uh, the Bible says that of the overcomers in Revelation 14 that they were not defiled with women. It didn't mean physically with women, it meant with these sectarian groups because they're likened them to women all through the Bible. So he's talking about men who come in and take captive groups of religious people here. That's what he's really talking about. And they're led away by lust. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Listen, you know they they study, 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 study. 
but they don't come to the knowledge of the truth. I've, I've read some of their books, you know, it's uh, a lot of psychology there, but all they need is the clear written word of God to bring them to the truth. I, I uh, interpreted a a dream from a, a minister sent me just the other day, just yesterday, as a matter of fact. This minister is over a lot of people. And so I poured out to him, you know, that uh, in Deuteronomy 28, the curse was that you'll borrow money and you won't lend. And the blessing was that you'll lend, but you shall not borrow. And in Deuteronomy 15, it's, uh, it commands his people that uh, you, shall, you shall lend unto many peoples, but thou shalt not borrow. And that's what he told God's people. Why? Because he wanted them to be the head and not the tail, he said. And he said, the borrower is servant to the lender in Proverbs. Right? And in the New Testament tells us, uh, owe no man anything but love. He doesn't want us to be in debt because when you're in debt, your money doesn't belong to the Lord. It belongs to the bankers and they own you. You understand that? They own you. They own all the money that, you, that comes in. You know, they own their, their portion of it. So you're in bondage to them instead of the Lord. Besides, God did that so that we would have to learn to walk by faith in him because he, he's our supplier. And surety ship. The Bible says he that loves surety ship is a fool. I, I gave him a whole bunch of verses. You know? Surety ship. He that loves surety ship is a fool. And he that strike of hands in surety ship he commands you not to do that. Surety ship is mortgaging us. It's uh, borrowing money and guaranteeing to pay back. So I sent him all these verses, you know, and gave him my opinion. He said, he thought, well, that's good. That's well said, you know. So he, he saw it. But you know what? A lot of God's people, they're not going to pay any attention to that. They don't care about that. They don't care that it's written in the Word. They only care what they need. And if they don't have any faith, which a lot of the leaders of Christianity don't really have any faith. So when you tell them the ways of faith, they can't even hear you. And they scoff at you. You know, because they're they're lovers of money. And what we just read there in, in Hosea chapter eight, you know, they they've made a god of their, their gold and their silver. And uh, they they are they have an affinity with the methods of the world. They're not like the disciples who Jesus sent out without their own provision. And when they came back he said, Lacked you anything? And they said, No, Lord, we didn't like anything. They learned to walk by faith. You know, the ministers, when Jesus sent out, the ministers Jesus sent out, they were people of faith. And they were chosen for that purpose, to be leaders of faith. But when the churches do things in the way of the world, they're ever learning and they're ever teaching the ways and the methods of the world, but they're never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 8 says, And even as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also withstand the truth. Men corrupted in mind, reprobate concerning the faith. Well, he's talking about leaders of Christianity in those days. Reprobate concerning the faith. They withstand the truth, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be evident unto all men. You know what? That's what's happening. That's what's happening around us. These great leaders of renown, you know, of uh, money and prestige, position, uh, their folly is going to proceed no longer. They shall proceed no longer, for their folly shall be made evident unto all men, as theirs also came to be. God's going to reveal them for who they are. He's going to let their traps trap them, as the Bible says. He said, but here's, here's the way out right here. Verse 10. But thou didst follow my teaching. Conduct. See, there's no teaching above scriptural teaching. We need to read the Word of God. We need to study the Word of God. Put it in our hearts. Give in to every principle in the Word. And conduct. Thou didst follow my teaching. Conduct. Hey, think about Paul's conduct. You know, do the ministers today act like the Apostle Paul? What's different about them? They're, they're out to impress 
the people of the world, right? They're out to make their gospel acceptable to the people of the world. And really, they are so much like the people of the world and do things with the methods of the people of the world that they are acceptable. They can fill churches. You understand, if you preach the gospel of the world, you can fill churches up. He said, Thou didst follow my teaching, conduct. Now, what was Paul's conduct? Paul's conduct, he was a man of faith, a man of power, a man uh, of a crucified life, a man who wasn't interested in pleasing the flesh or dragging the rich folks into his church, nor was he starting any organization. It was a spiritual body that he had entered into and all the ones that he preached to entered into it too. And his purpose, what was his purpose? His main drive was to get the gospel to the lost, right? To teach, raise up the saints in the knowledge of the word, the principles of the kingdom, to cause people to walk in the kingdom. And his faith, and his long-suffering, and his love, and his patience. See, if we follow our teachers in the Bible, which everybody has to do, ministers alike, these are our examples, these are our rocks. We fall back on them. Uh, and his patience. Persecutions, sufferings. You know what? The Bible says everyone that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's verse 12. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, that's what the people of the world the church today don't want to suffer any persecution. And they're not going to say anything that's going to cause them to suffer persecution or suffer in any form. They want to avoid suffering at all, all, all costs. You see. But we, like Paul, we have to follow in his conduct, his teaching, and if we do, we will suffer persecution. And he said, the things which befell me at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. If we're willing to go into persecution, the Lord will deliver us out, right? Yea, and all that would live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters, here's what, here's what are at the, you know, in Jesus' day and in our day, this is who's heading up Christianity. But evil men and imposters shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What is our, again, he falls back on the same teaching here. But abide thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. See, we have to go back to our teachers. We have to go back to our forefathers. We have to go back to the words written by the Apostle Paul and others because we know where we got them. We don't know where these men came from. <laughs> Let's believe what Jesus said, right? By down the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a babe thou hast known the sacred writings which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So, the sacred writings, you know, Paul said, learn not to go beyond the things that are written, the sacred writings. This is what, we don't need Sunday school books, we just need the sacred writings, right? We don't need men's interpretations of the scriptures. We just need the scriptures, right? Uh, these are what makes us wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ. Every scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction which is in righteousness. The man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. The word of God has got to mold us into its methods and its Thought. We have to take our mind from the scriptures. Uh, verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3, for the time will come, of course that's the last days he was talking about, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But having itching ears will heap to themselves teachers after their own lusts, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and turn aside unto fables. The church is full of fables, full of leaders that are worldly-minded, 
not led of the Spirit, rejecting the Spirit of God. You know, it doesn't matter if you have been filled with the Spirit, you can be speaking in tongues and still reject the Spirit of God, reject the leadership of the, the formal reign, the Holy Spirit. So many as are led by the Spirit of God. Elders were people who were matured in the Lord so that they could lead God's people. They were matured in following the Holy Spirit so that they could lead God's people. And, and now what we've got is a bunch of followers trying to catch people into their snares of their certain religion and put them into that religious bondage. See? The leadership. Uh, what is the snare that these uh, followers use? What kind of a snare do they use to entrap people into their religion? You know, one of the snares that the Bible talks about is that in Isaiah 8 and 14, you might be surprised. One of these snares is actually the Lord himself. Isaiah chapter 8. Verse 13. The Lord of hosts, him shall you sanctify. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both of the houses of Israel, and for a gin, and for a snare. A gin is a trap, right? For a trap and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble thereon, and fall, and be broken, and be snared, and be taken. Now, why would the Lord want to be a snare? And a stumbling block? You know, the doctrine of the Lord, again, makes us responsible. And it's a trap. When we, when we uh, accept the doctrines of men, the teachings of men, the traditions of men over and above the doctrine of the Lord, uh, we're being turned over to a reprobate mind by doing that. Just like we saw in Hosea chapter 9. Uh, we're being delivered over to that. And also, how can this Jesus be? A, I mean, they're using Jesus to bring people into the snare of Babylon. They're using the name of Jesus to bring people into the snare of battle. But it's not a Jesus um, a Jesus that a Jesus of the Bible is that golden calf of Samaria that God is talking about. Here. It's not that Jesus. So Jesus becomes a snare. In, uh, let's see, I think it's Romans chapter 11. Read that. Yeah, Romans 11, 7. What then? That which Israel seeketh for, that he obtained not. But the election obtained it, and the rest were hardened. According as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this very day. And David said, that their table be made a snare and a trap. There it is right there. Their doctrine, their table, is what they eat, is what they partake of, right? Their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them, that their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow Thou down their back always. So what's he talking about? He's talking about the people in the church that are not the elect of God. He said the, elect, the election obtained it and the rest were hardened. And how did he harden them? Their table became a snare. What they partook of becomes a snare. You know, their doctrine that they, you know, we, we, we eat the word of God, right? We eat the man out of heaven, the word of God, and it gives us life, right? But what a lot of churches feed on 
They're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That which they feed on is their trap. It is their snare. It is what keeps them in bondage. And the fowler puts out this trap too. Not only is he trapped by it, because the Bible says that, that they that dig a pit shall fall into it themselves. You know, a pit was used for a trap, right? Well, the people who are trying to uh, snare people into their kingdom so that they can live a, a very rich life, right? And so that they can have the prestige of having a lot of people, you know, under them. Uh, they want to be leaders. They lust for leadership and uh, authority and these things, you know, and for the high life. Right? Uh, these people are using using a, a false doctrine to snare people with a Jesus that really doesn't exist. It's a false Jesus, and it's a snare. It's a trap. They want they they give you a Jesus who is acceptable to the worldly fleshly mind. A Jesus that does not expect you to lose your life in this world. A Jesus that does not expect you to be a disciple after the order of the first order of disciples. Right? A Jesus that accepts worldly religion. A form of godliness that denies the power thereof. For which we're told we're commanded to, to turn away. That's a trap. That's a snare. Um, Luke 21 and 34 is another form of that trap, I think. Let me read this one more verse and we'll see who that is the next question. Luke 21. There's a prayer request. Now. Prayer request. Luke 21 and verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest happily your heart be overcharged with surfeiting. And drunkenness, you know, that's overindulging, right? And drunkenness. And he's not necessarily talking about physical drunkenness, but uh, being out of touch with reality and uh, the cares of this life. If that day come upon you as a snare, you know, the day is coming as a snare. What day is he talking about? The day of judgment, the day of wrath. Is coming upon a lot of people who are overindulging in the world, loving the world, the high life of the world. They're not seeking the conduct and the teaching of the Apostle Paul. But they're seeking the world. And he's saying that, that day will come on those people as a snare, as a trap. For so shall it come upon all them that dwell upon the face of, the, of all of the earth. See, if you're not dwelling in heavenly places by abiding in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that he chose us to be in Christ in the foundation of the world and uh, to be seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you're either abiding in heavenly places because you're abiding in Christ or you're abiding in this world. And what he's saying is everybody will be snared that's living in the world and of the world. And not abiding in Christ. Now what is abiding in Christ? Abiding in Christ. According to 1 John. Is. Um, walking as he walked. 1 John 1. And 6. Excuse me, two and six. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So we're learning to walk in the steps of Jesus. The things that are important to us are the things that are important to Jesus. The works that we do are his works. He said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. So we're we're coming into the ministry of Jesus. And also abiding in Christ is uh, uh, chapter two and verse. 24, as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If that which you heard from the beginning abide in you, you also shall abide in the Son and in the Father. So only if the doctrine that we receive from the Scripture abides in us are we abiding in Christ. If we're receiving a doctrine of religion, especially one that rejects the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, 
And he tells us to turn away from them because that's not abiding in Christ. There's no safety. There's no salvation there. And uh, also, 3 and 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. We're not going to be walking in willful disobedience if we are abiding in him. So, abiding in him and not in this world. If you're abiding in him, you're abiding in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We can do this by faith in God. It's his power. He's given it to us. Anything else is just a trap. It's just a trap of religion. It's a trap of the fowler. It's a snare of the fowler to trap us into religion. Okay, what was that, Terry? You heard? Yeah, Sister Rose asked that we lift up her husband in prayer to believe and to be born again. Um, she said thanks tonight. She had to go. She had to go. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do ask you, Lord, to draw Rose's husband, to put the power of the Spirit in him, to put a hunger and a thirst for righteousness in him, and to help him to see that this whole world is going down. Lord, put the fear of God in him, and put the love of God in him, and put a hunger and a thirst for your word in him, and just draw him, Lord. We know that no one comes unto the Son except the Father draws. So we're agreeing today that you're going to draw him, that you're desiring him, working him to will and to do of your good pleasure. And you do receive it from your life. In Jesus' name. And we had a testimony at the beginning before we really got started. Or you got started before I could get to it. <laughs> Well, let me finish, yeah, go ahead. Let me finish this, and then we'll, we'll get back to that testimony, okay? Um, we probably won't open the mic up last, right? <laughs> okay. so let's, let's go ahead and study this a little bit more, okay? Um, so how do we escape the snare of the fire? You know, Paul mentioned it three times in Timothy there, how we escaped it, by letting our doctrine be his doctrine. You know, his doctrine be our doctrine. And uh, not giving in to any other thought, any other teaching, you know. Uh, only The only doctrine that we can receive is that which was given in the beginning. And, uh, not the doctrines of man. But the scriptures uh, show us that there's a way of escape from the snare of the power. For instance, uh, Psalm 91 speaks to that, doesn't it? Psalm 91, in verse 1, 2, and 3. And we're right back to the same thing. For he says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And of course, Jesus Christ is the secret place of the Most High. Um, 90. Chapter 90 and verse 1, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. So, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High is dwelling in the Lord. Right? He shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And verse 3, for he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowl and from the deadly pestilence. You know, notice he's comparing the snare of the fowler with all these very deadly and dangerous things. Because it is dangerous. You know, losing your eternal soul because you've been trapped by Babylon and uh, following a Jesus that does not exist and uh, having a doctrine in your heart that does not cause you to be approved of God. That's very dangerous. You know, he said in Hosea 2 that uh, Ephraim had children that were strange children. That was Hosea, Hosea 5 and 7. That she had brought forth strange children. Well, how does that happen? You know, if the Word of God is what creates sonship in us and brings us into the image of Jesus Christ. Then the false doctrines of 
of apostate Christianity cannot bring you into the image of Jesus Christ. They can bring you into the image of religion. That's very dangerous. That's a strange child. That's a child that God doesn't know. You know, the Lord is going to be faced with a lot of people that claim to be his children. And say, Lord, can we continue teaching our streets and so on and so forth? And he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. You know, a father knows his children. And uh, if we've been created in the image of religion or doctrines that are not of this word, then we're strange children. In other words, we don't look like the father, right? The Lord knows those that are his because they're going to look like him, right? Uh, another thing uh, in Psalm 119. And 19, Psalm 119. 98, verse 98. It says, Thy commandments make me wiser than mine enemies. They are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For thy testimonies on my meditation. Isn't that interesting? You can have more understanding than all the religious leaders that you've been under, under all than all the teachers that you've been under. Because the important thing to you is the Word of God. And uh, it was like that with me. I mean, I, I outgrew my what I really consider my the first pastor that I had in the Pentecostal church. I outgrew him very quickly. Uh, he was blinded by by religion, by false doctrines. And uh, I was seeing through them right and left. God's grace was with me because I was abiding in Christ and I was seeking the truth from the Word of God. And I really put my trust in men. And, uh, and so God helped me to outgrow him, basically. People might think, well, that's a proud thing. That guy was in the Lord for 40 years before I ever come around. But the thing is, you can be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You can be in the Lord all of your life, so-called, and still not come to know Him. Because you're putting ahead of Him and ahead of His Word doctrines that, that don't manifest Him. Uh, you know, what, look at 124, Psalm 124. Verse um, 6. You know, I talked about the worthless shepherds, how that they ate the flesh of the fat sheep. No, they lived off the sheep, right? And it says here in verse 6, that Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Have you ever been there? I was. <laughs> the snare was broken as far as I was concerned and I escaped. <clears throat> I had a respect for religion. God delivered by his grace. And where is our help? Verse 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is his nature and his character and his authority, right? That's where our help comes from. We can escape the snare of the foul by putting our trust in the Lord, by asking God for truth. You know, you say, well, David, I'm not going to any of these uh, religions and I'm not a part of it. But you know what? You still got things in you that came from them, right? And we need to not only come out of Egypt, we need to get Egypt out of us, don't we? And if we put our trust in the Lord and ask the Lord to lead us and guide us in truth, he's going to do just that. He's going to lead us and guide us in truth. We have to be careful of idols, because if we have idols in our life, we'll be delivered over to false doctrine. Yeah, Terry? Michael, I'm 
uh, today, it seems like you have to be in a church with a minister that has a degree, or else people do not respect it. Well, the people that would respect you for that purpose um, don't count. <laughs> that's true. I tell you, that's the people that don't count. If it looks like to me in the 70s and 70s, instead of the church, well, I'm not conquer the world, the world is coming to conquer the church. And I really didn't understand then what he was talking about. That's exactly right. The world has conquered the church. Yeah. We're talking about the moon coming in and in, in America that claims to be a Christian country, you know, being crowned as the Messiah. Imagine. That's so silly. It's a big, 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 big ceremony. They walk forward with this big crown. Yeah, big crown and put it on his head. I can't believe they would tell us something like that. Mm-hmm. Boy, they were running for cover once. As anti-Christian as the broadcast system is, you surprised. Now, I wonder what all those preachers would say now. You know, the ones that put in those organizations so he could support them. That was timely that this, this article sent out to the people and then, then they showed them and gave you a hug way to wake the people up. Yeah, that, that is amazing. There will be a follow-up to that. I'll we'll get the, the news here in the next day or two on this big ordeal where he was his inauguration or whatever is the Messiah. Yep. Or nation. Well, what is happening? God is is taking away the wisdom of these leaders. They're going to lead large portions of Christianity into the tribulation and never believe the tribulation even started, and bring them into bondage, uh, into submission to to this worldly state. And uh, and cause them to take the mark of the beast because they're not going to recognize it. I remember, remember what I said about uh, my friend Mark, who we hadn't seen in years when we were talking about the mark of the beast. And, and uh, he had just had a dream about going to the One World Church and, and and stumbling into a minister's conference where they were teaching them how to give the mark of the beast without people knowing about it. And uh, they were beaming the light across their forehead and giving them the mark of the beast without them knowing about it. The light is the word of God. You just use the word of God and cause Christians to believe that they are Christians or cause people to believe that they are Christians because they obey your false dogma. And you're still walking in the mind of the flesh and the works of the flesh then you're taking the mark of the beast. And ministers are giving God's people the mark of the beast without them even knowing it. They'll be prepared to take the physical mark because they're taking the spiritual mark, walking in the flesh, not walking in the spirit. How can we walk in the spirit without receiving the spirit or submitting to the spirit's words? We can't walk in the spirit. You know, back in Jeremiah 5, where we were, he said, uh, when I had fed them to the full, they committed adultery and assembled themselves in troops at the harlot's houses. You know, there's a spiritual application to that, you know. That's exactly what's happening. Is God's people are assembling in troops at the harlot's houses. And God said he's going to take away their branches. Can quench my thirsting soul Pure as water made me whole Let your streams of mercy flow Oh Jesus, I trust in you Though the mountains fall into the sea Though the rivers rise, I still believe For your mercy stands and your word is true Oh Jesus, 